Hey, thanks for joining me. It's season four of Catholic Breakfast. We're taking a look at Why Be Catholic. We're kind of tracking along with this marvelous little book by a good friend of mine, Trent Horn, amazing Catholic apologist. Chapter 22, I think, is the chapter we're kind of looking at. I know a lot of people struggle with the Catholic understanding of sexuality, Catholic moral teaching, and sexual issues. But look, I just, for my money, it's just such a great reason to be Catholic. I remember in my, my senior year in college, kind of studying it, writing a paper on it. I, I discovered like John Paul II's theology of the body, his vision of the human person, how sexuality fits into it. And I was like, this is like the most amazing thing I've ever heard. And it, I just, it made me just double down on being Catholic. I just didn't hear anything else in the culture which came anywhere near like the majesty, the mercy, the balance, and frankly, just the sheer beauty of a vision of what human sexuality is and how it fits into what it means to be happy. We're just looking at why Catholics' understanding of sexuality is tough to top. That's, that's what we're getting at. It's rich and powerful. You know, and, and I know it's controversial, but and there's a lot of heat around sexuality. This video is to try to bring a little bit of light. So here's the first reason. The Catholic vision of sexuality provides an integrated vision of the human person. At the heart of our understanding of sexuality is what you'd call a dual ends understanding. Dual in the sense of two, right? Dual ends. There's two ends to, uh, to sexuality in terms of the sexual act. Mainly life and love. And this is recognizable not because the church teaches it. It's recognizable through reason alone. Just through like philosophy, just recognizing the phenomenon human sexuality needs to keep together or at least not intentionally violate that our sexuality is about love, willing the good of the other person, relationship, intimacy, and it's about life. It has a biological component related to procreation. The two are distinct. They're not exactly the same thing. You can't say one is the other. They're two distinct aspects. One is maybe related to the spirit. Like, I love you. You're my soulmate. <laughs> And one is related to the body, right? Uh, the, the procreation and <laughs> how the species continues going. The two are different, but they, they're, they're meant to go together. They, they're in an inseparable relationship. Trent's uh, chapter on this is really, really um, helpful because it, it helps, if you read it carefully, I think it'll help you see that the Catholic social sexual ethic is not about following rules. The dual ends, life and love, are really about integration of body and soul. How it's not that my body is bad and my soul is good, or my soul is, is, is bad and my body is good or something. The human being is both together at the same time. And in the vision of sexuality, it's meant to uplift the dignity of both and integrate them uh, together. This is where uh, Trent's stuff on sexual honesty is great. So the body speaks a language, and, and it's a language of love, like, you know, I hug you, shake a hand, um, or engage in the marital act that communicates something. And the communication of the body sexually has a certain language. It's meant to say, I love you, and I want to have babies with you, which means I want to be around you. A good friend of mine sent out a tweet years ago, and I, I've never forgotten it. She said, you are the sum total of everything your ancestors thought was beautiful. I mean, you could spend a lifetime meditating on that, right? When I do marriage prep with couples, I'll often just ask them about whether or not they want to have kids. And if they're in love, it's, it's just another way of saying, do you love him? <laughs> do you want to see like another generation? Do you want to see a little person who has, you know, his eyes and your nose? So, so it's just like intuitive and natural for people when they're healthy and, they're, and they love each other. They understand, I love you and I want to be around you, have kids with you, have a family with you, are just deeply integrated. The Catholic social ethic is meant to keep those together to affirm the goodness of the person, both spiritually and physically. Sex matters for us as Catholics. It's never just like a recreational thing because the person matters and the body matters. That's why Catholicism always has this high understanding of sexuality, the high demand, the high uh, vision. Here's the second reason why the Catholic vision is tough to top. Not just that it, ha it integrates body and soul and, and, and affirms the whole person precisely as body and soul, but it also works practically. 
the violation of the dual ends, like if you, if you keep the dual ends together or at least never violate them, it tends to work. People feel loved, supported, lifted up uh, as body and soul. If, if you intentionally violate or render asunder, <laughs> separate the, the life or the love aspect of sexuality, it almost just doesn't work, almost inevitably. It typically ends in pain, disappointment, and suffering sooner or later. Think of divorce, think of outright betrayal and infidelity, think of anger, hatred, even direct violence that ensues when some violation of the dual ends happens. Let me ask you th this question, just consider this. What rattles around the history of a person or a family more than when the dual ends of sexuality are violated? I mean, seriously, think about it. Think of some pain or deep disappointment, anger, skeleton in the closet, hatred, cold shoulder, grudge, I'm not talking with you, we don't talk with that person. Very often in a family, it's because the dual ends were violated. And I know I'm using philosophical language there, but I'll, I'll say it in more just kind of common language. When someone isn't faithful to the person they're sleeping with, what hurts people more than that? What creates long-term suffering more than that? When people aren't faithful spiritually, right, as a person, to the person they're physically sleeping with. I mean, it's just so obvious <laughs> to us as Catholics, and I think to any um, thinking person, just how obvious that is. Rape, incest, infidelity, like that stuff is brutal, right? It's brutal and it really wreaks havoc. So that's the second reason why the dual ends, what sounds like philosophy or some high demand, it's really just like common sense. It doesn't work when you intentionally separate them. The objection I think maybe most common today is either spoken or unspoken. It's something like, that's too difficult. That's just not, that's just not possible. It's too difficult for whatever reason. Uh, and the other one is like, who the heck is the church to tell me what to do sexually? That's probably the, the, the most common. So look to the first one. Unlimited sexual freedom in our culture is like a god, right? It's like unassailable. It's basically sovereign in our culture. Unlimited sexual freedom. It's, it's kind of like a non-negotiable. So to even say there's like a right way to live sexual morality, it, it, it just creates such a stir in people's in the room and sort of shuts people down intellectually that it's really, really difficult to even have this conversation. People today tend to equate sexual freedom with self-governance. Like my human dignity to govern my whole life is basically coterminous or coextensive. It's the same thing as my sexual freedom. Whatever you want to say about that, which I think is just a reduction of the human person to sexual desire, which I, and I think human beings are much more complicated than that. And that's the church's understanding as well, I think. The church's job is to make saints. And a saint is somebody capable of love, body and soul. And that includes sexuality. It's more than sexuality, but it includes that. So like take erotic desire. The church likes erotic desire, but it wants to integrate erotic desire into love for God and love for neighbor. I mean, that's what it means to be a saint. Love God, love neighbor. Erotic desire, sexual desire, is meant to be integrated into that, just like every other good desire in life is meant to be integrated into love for God and love for neighbor. Now, the, the argument that the, the call of the, the, of the, the Catholic Church you know, to live a, a, a healthy sexual ethic, is it difficult? He sure it is. But it's difficult to love. And what in life worth doing is easy? Not much. Anyway, yeah, that, the, you know, I think the, that points out maybe a final reason why the church's sexual ethic, her vision of sexuality is tough to top. It's because it's a path to holiness. It, it's a path to become a saint. And therefore, it's a path to happiness. And I'd highlight this to close. It's a path to holiness and happiness for everybody regardless of someone's experience or history of sexuality, how, however that looks, we're all called to walk the path of holiness towards happiness. And that involves the integration of 
everything we are as human beings, including the dual ends of sexuality. God bless you.